Well, um, this morning, what I want to do is I want to um, take a little test with you. It is a test that I found online, and so you do your very best to, to score yourself. I'm going to ask you 11 questions. I'm not going to tell you what kind of test this is until we're done, and then you can determine how well you scored. Question number one, do you crave attention and admiration? Question number two, do you have trouble recognizing the feelings and needs of others? Are you often preoccupied with the thoughts of success and power and status? Do you often tell other people about your power and status? Do you think that you overestimate your achievements and talents? Do you undervalue the achievements and talents of others? Do you feel upset when people around you achieve success? Do you have trouble receiving criticism? even when that criticism is valid? Do you believe that you are unique and that only special people can see how unique you are? Do you believe that others are envious of you or jealous of you? And do you feel entitled to favorable treatments? And you say, well, what are these questions a test for, it is a narcissism test. And you can find any of these online, but you just use a simple zero to five scale, and you can quickly find out if you're minimally narcissistic, mildly strong, or even severe. And depending on what you score for this particular online test anyway, you can begin to chat with a therapist that will probably tell you that you are suffering from a narcissistic personality disorder. You say, well, what's some of the symptoms of this NPD, narcissistic personality disorder? And maybe this acronym might help you to remember. It's It's just nine signs that you are suffering from this narcissistic personality disorder. And the acronym is Special Me. Special me. The S is a sense of self-importance. The P is preoccupation with power, beauty, or success. The E is for entitlement. The C means that you can only be around people who are important or special or significant. The I is for interpersonally exploitive for your own gain. The A is for arrogant. The L is a lack of empathy. And the me, must be admired and envious of others. Special me. Now, I have to admit that when I started reading some of these articles and I found out that they were arguing that narcissistic people are not actually bad people, it's just their behaviors that are a little unbecoming. They've been passively conditioned to believe that they are special and they do deserve better than most others, and then that's how they approach the world and other relationships. Well, the Bible has a word for that kind of behavior, and that word is called sin, selfishness, pride. And the Bible doesn't try to hide this sin or pass it off as just some sort of disorder. What we learn from the pages of Scripture that this Mentality, this attitude is actually ingrained in the very fabric of our being. That we are born with a focus on self. And what we learn from God's word is that if we continue down this road of being so self consumed, and if we think that we're like the sun, the center of the universe, then what happens is everything actually falls out of orbit. 
if we think that our life and our talents and our ministry is what is most important, and if we think that everything and everyone must revolve around us, then we're guilty of being that big gas giant of a planet called narcissistic. And I'll tell you this, the devil loves when we make everything about ourselves. The devil loves when our focus is primarily and only on us. In fact, it's one of the temptations that the disciples struggled with. On more than one occasion, you know this from the reading of the Gospels, that the Twelve would get into these petty arguments about which one of us is the greatest. The Twelve even had an attitude of rivalry and envy, self-promoting, and it's that kind of attitude that can easily derail the faith and certainly the kind of attitude that destroys unity in the church. And so Jesus would instruct them time and time again, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. While the disciples may have done a much better job in following after Christ if they had maybe been more in tune with John the Baptist's message and that brother's attitude. See, if anyone had bragging rights, it was John. You look at his resume. I mean, he had a legitimate claim by the very words of Jesus to be the greatest man ever born of a woman. And yet, when we come to our text this morning, what we see is that John the Baptist was thoroughly convinced that his life was not about trying to point to his greatness. No, instead, he saw himself as a lowly servant. So let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 3, and why don't you join me and stand, let me read God's Word to us, Luke chapter 3, and I'm looking at verses 15 through 20. Here's God's word for us. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation and all were reasoning in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered, saying to them, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, to thoroughly clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the gospel to the people. But when Herod, the Tetrarch, was reproved by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod was also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. You may have a seat, and would you join me as we pray? Father, we are so indebted to you, and it's a debt that we can never pay. And so the only thing we can do is offer you our gratitude and our worship and our humble obedience for the revelation of your word. Thank you, God, for the word and its power and how it points us to Jesus, our Savior. May we delight ourselves in him as we look to your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, amen. Our main idea for this morning as we look at this text of scripture centers around John the Baptist. John the Baptist's life and ministry pointed to Jesus Christ, who should be preeminent in all our ultimate loyalties and affections. Let me say it again for us. John the Baptist's life and ministry pointed to Jesus Christ, who should be preeminent in all our ultimate loyalties and affections. The way John the Baptist honored Jesus was by telling the people who he was, by pointing the people away from himself and on to him. The people wanted to talk about how John, how great John was, 
But his response was to point to someone who was far, far greater. And that really should be the goal of all of us, of every follower of Christ, to deflect the recognition and the praise and the attention and the honor and point squarely to Jesus and say, it is all him. Well, as John's ministry began to fade and Jesus' ministry begins to launch, what we learn about the rival of Jesus is that his ministry brings, and here's our outline, a greater expectation. We see that in verse 15. A greater ministry in verse 16. A greater judgment in verse 17. A greater gospel urgency in verse 18 and a greater opposition in verses 19 through 20. With the fading of John's ministry and the launching of Jesus's, a greater expectation, a greater ministry, a greater judgment, a greater gospel urgency, and a greater opposition. So that will guide our time as we walk through this text. Now, this section here actually parallels Matthew chapter 3 and Mark chapter 1, but Interestingly, Luke is the only one that gives us a little bit more information, these introductory words, and we see that there in verse 15. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation and all were reasoning in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ. Now, this word for expectation, it's in the present tense, which simply means that the people were continually anticipating the Messiah's arrival. And the text also says that they're reasoning That's also in the present tense. So this is something that's going on and on and on. And the Greek word here is dialogizomai. And that's where we get the word dialogue from, which means that they're having this dialogue internally within themselves. Could this really be the one? Is he finally here? Is John the Messiah? And so we know that messianic expectations are, are off the charts With John's arrival, those that came out to see John saw something unique. It was actually extraordinary. The people wanted to hear a prophet. No one has been speaking, thus saith the Lord, for 400 years. And so when John steps on the scene with all of this self-denial and strange dress and calling people to repentance, and he's even baptizing, people are saying, is the time come? Is the Messiah finally here? Is he going to bring salvation and restoration to Israel? And this is despite the fact that John is not performing any miracles. He's just preaching the word and baptizing. And that is causing quite a commotion. And this is all the way out in the wilderness so that people in the cities by the thousands are coming to visit John to hear him preach. Now, the apostle John tells us that it was at this time that there was a little committee that was put together and some of the religious leaders sent envoys to go and ask this question, who are you? Turn with me to John chapter 1 so you can see this for yourself. John chapter 1 and verse 19. And we read here in John 1, 19, And this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? And he, that's John, confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Therefore, they said to him, well, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Verse 23, and he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, why are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And if you keep reading there, according to verses 26 and 27 of John chapter 1, it was On this occasion that John uttered the words that we find here in Luke 3, 16. And his answer makes it very, very clear to the crowds that 
His message is not the final message. And what they've been anticipating and looking for and longing for is actually not him. In fact, there's one that is coming that is way mightier than John. And he'd arrive on the scene six months later. This brings us to point number two, that with the arrival of the Messiah comes a much greater ministry. Look there at verse 16. John answered, saying to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John, doing his very best to point the attention away from him and to the true Messiah, he says, look, the Messiah who's coming is far greater than me. And that might seem obvious to us because we have all of the Gospels and all of the New Testament. But just look here at how he creates distance between his ministry and what he's doing and what Jesus is going to come and do. John says, I, I baptize you with water. But he is going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Think about the significance of that alone. You're submerged into water. What does the water do for you? It represents maybe an internal cleaning, a washing, a cleansing, a change of mind. Maybe it is a a fruit of repentance. But what does being immersed in the Spirit of God do for you? What changes everything? Your trajectory. You're given a new heart. You're given a new destination. You're given a new righteousness. You're baptized, immersed into his own life. His perfect law-keeping is, is yours when he gives you his spirit. You're adopted into the family of God, the church. John says, I, I baptize with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit of God. And he's just getting started. Look at what he says next. But one is coming who is mightier than I. I love the word choice here because he chooses this word intentionally. He doesn't say that one who is coming is more important than I or, or better than I or, or greater than I or, or more significant than I. And all those things would be true. But what John says is he is mightier than I. And all three synoptic gospels record the same word That word, mightier, in the Greek, it means exponentially stronger. This is surpassing strength, transcendent power. The same Greek word is actually used in the Septuagint, the the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 32. And there, it refers to God himself. And so we've talked about this and we'll continue to talk about this as we move through the Gospel of Luke. Whenever someone says, I don't believe that the Bible says that Jesus is God, it's all over the place. In Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17, we read this. Ah, Lord Yahweh, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. And look at this. O great and mighty God. Same word. Yahweh of hosts is his name. Great in counsel and abundant in deeds, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Listen, this description that John gives, that one is coming who is mightier than I, this isn't just a man. He's not saying that the one who's coming after me can can bench press more than me or, or squat more than me. He's saying, no, there's one coming with God power. And I'm no match for that kind of strength. 
But not only will Jesus be far above John as it relates to ability, but he's going to be far above him as it relates to nobility. The the honor and homage that Jesus is owed is beyond John's comprehension. And he wants us to get a glimpse of this as he's preaching in the wilderness. And so much so that he says, I am not even adequate to untie the Messiah's sandals. Look there at verse 16. He says, I'm not fit to untie the straps of his sandals. Now, nowadays, it's quite not the same because parents do this all the time for their children and teachers will stoop down and touch someone's feet. And the guy at Foot Locker has no problem unlacing some new Jordans for you to try on, if that's your thing. But back then, you didn't come near someone's feet. You just didn't do that. Unless you were a slave. You have to remember that in that culture, it was also a sign to show hospitality, to untie someone's sandals, and then to get down and wash their feet. But that's not what you did. You had servants do that. You see, what John is getting at here is that he is keenly aware that he's not even worthy to be the lowest of low servants for the Messiah. I don't quote uh, Thomas Aquinas very much, but when I read this comment by him, I thought it was worth repeating. He says this in writing about John. He says, he touches on the greatness of Christ's superiority as if to say, you must not suppose that he ranks ahead of me in dignity in the way that one man is placed ahead of another. No, rather, he is ranked so far above me that I am nothing in comparison to him. That is how immense and immeasurable the Messiah's worth is compared to John the Baptist. Again, the greatest man to have ever lived And he doesn't even dare stoop down to unlace his sandals, which helps us understand maybe the the tone or, or the attitude that John the Baptist may have answered with when the crowd suspected that he was the Messiah. Are 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 you the Christ? Not even close. Not even close. Listen, even if I am the the lowliest of the low slave, I have no business coming anywhere near his feet. That is an amazing posture of humility. And listen, this this isn't false humility. This is humility grounded in reality. The reason why Jesus can say that he is the greatest ever born of woman is probably because of his understanding of where he stood in relation to Jesus. That he knew that he was not even worthy to be a slave of King Jesus. And listen, you and I, we don't hold a candle to John the Baptist. So when you're tempted to think that you're something, that you're special, that you're gifted, that your ministry is great, your service is great, that people need you, think about John the Baptist. Think about his posture, his humility. If he says, I am unworthy, what does that say about you and me? Listen, no one is more worthy of glory and honor than Jesus. No one is more worthy of worship. And yet, how sweet that the Lord has called us to himself to lift up his name, to proclaim him to the nations, to represent him as his children Everything that we do in the name of Christ, all of our worship, all of our teaching, all of our witnessing, all of our service, it should be done. Listen, brothers and sisters, it must be done with an attitude of 
absolute awe and total humility, not drawing attention to ourselves, not thinking that we are some sort of big deal. I love what J.C. Ryle said about a true godly person. He said you'll be able to identify them, spot them. This is what he said. A true man of God will never allow anything to be credited to him or his office, which belongs to his divine master. No, instead, he will, like St. Paul, say, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake, to commend Christ dying and rising again for the ungodly, to make known Christ's love and power to save sinners. This will be the main object of his ministry. And then he says this, he will be content that his own name be forgotten so long as Christ crucified is exalted. And so John, he identifies, I'm nothing. Christ, he is more mighty. He is more worthy. And then he gives the reason why. Look there what he says next. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, we know that there's a major difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. And you say, Dom, remind me what the difference is between these these two. And again, John's baptism was about preparation and dedication. John prepared people to receive the Messiah. It was a baptism of repentance in which a person recognized their sin and recognized their need for God and for forgiveness which means that the physical act of baptism in the Jordan, it was just a symbol of an outward confession of repentance. But while the people confessed their sin, John had no power to forgive that sin. Which is to say, you could be baptized in water and not be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that happens all across our country and all across the world. People are baptized, but they're not genuinely saved. No, the greater spiritual baptism would be ushered in by Jesus, who not only has the power to forgive sins, but has the power to grant the Holy Spirit. And it's when Jesus immerses someone into the Holy Spirit that their heart is changed forever. And sin is forgiven. And we can now call him Abba, Father. And we're sealed for the day of redemption. And we're guaranteed glorification. And only Jesus can do that. You can be immersed in water without experiencing any change. But the Bible is very clear that if you have been immersed by the Spirit, your life is completely transformed and it becomes observable. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 reads this, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. No matter how much water, no matter how many times you get dunked or sprinkled, If your mind is set on the flesh, you remain hostile to God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. If you want to subject yourself to the life of God, you need to be reborn. You need the Spirit of God that comes to you only by the Son of God. Okay, so I think we understand that Jesus is the only one who is able to baptize with the Spirit. Yes? Okay, but... What do we make about this baptism of fire? Well, that's a a totally different topic, or is it? How do we understand this baptism of fire? And as you can imagine, there are all kinds of interpretations. Some would suggest that these are two different works of the Spirit, two separate baptisms. Others would say that being baptized with fire means that you should be able to speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you really don't have the Spirit of God. Others suggest that baptism in the Spirit means salvation, and then baptism in fire means sanctification. And they point to the places of Scripture where fire is sort of symbolic of purification, illumination. Fire warms and it heats, and 
It does all kinds of other things. Still, others interpret baptism of fire as referring to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was sent from heaven. And so we read that in Acts chapter 2. There appeared to them tongues like what? Fire. But if we're just looking at the language, there's a like fire. It's not talking about a literal fire. So how do we determine what this baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire is? And I think we can cut through many of the interpretations by just looking at the syntax and the context. When we talk about understanding the Bible, we we have to look at it as a whole. And the first thing I want you to be aware of is that in the Greek, there's only one preposition that is used for the spirit and fire. So we don't see it in the English, but it's there in the Greek, the preposition in. So the Greek reads, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. The in is attached to both the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, if we look at the context back at verse 7, go look, look at your Bible, verse 7. John asks this, who warns you to flee from what? The wrath to come. And that implies a few things. First, it implies, obviously, wrath is coming, but also it implies that you can escape wrath. You can escape it if you turn to Jesus. But for those who don't escape, for those who don't repent, for those who don't come to Christ, for those who don't bear fruit keeping with repentance, verse 9, they will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You see, I think the syntax, the context tells us that wrath is coming, and it is coming with fire. And this helps us to identify what the baptism of the Spirit in fire means. The fire is judgment. When Christ comes, he will save and give the Spirit. For those who don't have the Spirit, what's reserved for them is judgment and fire. You know, if the fire is merely referring to cleansing, I don't think we would have what we have in the next verse regarding the Messiah, that he's going to separate the wheat and the chaff and burn the chaff. And this brings us to our third point. The arrival of Jesus brings a greater expectation, a greater ministry, and a greater judgment. Look there at verse 17. It says, his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now listen, when I was a kid growing up in East LA, I had some chores. One of my chores was to go in the backyard with a big avocado tree and I would have to sweep the leaves. And I would sweep the leaves and gather the leaves and throw them in the tin trash can that I had a, it didn't roll out, I had to carry it out, which was really hard. That was back in the day. Uh, I have no idea what a winnowing fork is or a threshing floor. But when Jess and I went to Israel on our campus there in Yad Hashmonad, there was a biblical garden and there were all these agricultural and cultural concepts that really came to life for us because There was a wine press, and there were millstones, and there were winnowing forks and threshing floors. And so in my mind, it makes sense now, but I want to give you just a few pictures here to help you maybe figure this out in your own head. Here's a picture of a winnowing fork. You say, it looks like a fork. That's right, it's a winnowing fork. Here's a picture of a threshing floor where all the wheat is gathered, And the objective was to separate the wheat from the tares or the wheat from the chaff. And during harvest, the farmer would use this winnowing fork to toss the stalks and heads of grain into the air. And there would be a breeze that would come. And then the wheat would fall because it was heavier and it would be collected. And the chaff would be blown away and also collected and burned because it was not good 
for anything. And this whole concept is an Old Testament metaphor of judgment. Going all the way back to the book of Job, in Job 21, we read this, verse 17, how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? There is straw before the wind, like chaff which the storm stills away. And you're very familiar with Psalm chapter 1. Well, we're reminded there in Psalm 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his law is what? In the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They're like chaff, which the wind drives away. But notice back in our text, the chaff is not just blown away. It says he gathers the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff. This is an eschatological metaphor of the righteous being gathered from the evil worlds to be home with God forever but the unrighteous being gathered up to go away to eternal punishment. Notice, there's only two possible outcomes. Only two. You either in God's barn or you get burned. Those are the only two options. Now, some have wrongly supposed, and this is preached quite often, God is too loving. He is too loving to send anyone to hell for all of eternity where there is burning and weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let's create something called purgatory and a cleansing that happens. It's a purifying punishment that only lasts a certain duration. But listen, when when fire is used to clean something, When that thing is cleansed, the fire goes out. What we have here in this text is that this is an unquenchable fire. And that's because the fires of hell are not reserved for purification or for cleansing, but they are reserved for damnation and torment. And that's why John uses this word. It's unquenchable quenchable fire. That that Greek word just means extinguish or it means to quench and it has the alpha primitive on the beginning of it to say that this is something that is never extinguished. This is something that never goes out. This is a fire that cannot be quenched. And so people say, well, if the fire is going to go on forever, then it must mean that God annihilates everybody who is not a believer which is also very popular in the evangelical world. We, we can't stomach this thought of eternal conscious torment. And so rather than dealing with what the Bible says, we say God just blots everyone out. He just zaps people, annihilates them, and they no longer exist. But you go back, even to the fourth century, and Augustine said this, to say that it, Life eternal shall be endless, but that punishment eternal shall come to an end. He said that's the height of absurdity. He goes on to say, if both heaven and hell are eternal, it follows necessarily that either both are to be taken as a long-lasting but finite or both as endless and perpetual. The phrases eternal punishment and eternal life are parallel And it would be absurd to use them in one and the same sentence to mean eternal life will be infinite, while eternal punishment will have an end. Hence, because the eternal life of the saint will be endless, the eternal punishment also for those condemned to it will assuredly have no end. Listen, hell is a place of eternal punishment. Fire, burning that goes on and on and on. And Jesus says a lot about it. 
Matthew 25, 41, he was saying to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark chapter 9, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and fire is not quenched. And Jesus will go on to say that in verse 46 and 48, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Listen, the Messiah's judgment is coming and John is warning everyone that this mightier one, this powerful one, this one who is deserving of all honor and glory and allegiance, you don't have forever. You need to repent and believe because he's coming and the winnowing fork is in his hand and he's already at the threshing floor and he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat will remain and get into God's barn, his house, his kingdom, his presence. But the chaff will be gathered and burned forever and ever. Listen, the ideal of eternal conscious torment that should terrify each one of us, should spur us on to believe, to cling to Christ with everything we got. But it should also compel us to preach the gospel. This is the only way people will be saved. Jonathan Edwards wrote one of the greatest sermons. In fact, a lot of his writings, no one paints the picture of hell strongly like he does. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards says about those who are going to hell. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever, a boundless duration before you, which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul, and you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions and millions of ages in wrestling and conflicting with this almighty, merciless vengeance. And then you will have so done when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains. And this is why we have to preach the gospel. This is why we have to warn people this is why we have to plead with mom and dad and brothers and sisters and kids and friends and neighbors and relatives and strangers because hell is real and the gospel is the only thing that saves. Which brings us to the greater urgency in verse 18. Verse 18 says, So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the gospel to the people. And I just want to make this more of a point of application for us. It's precisely because Jesus is coming back as the judge that we need to be clear on what the gospel is. And so you say, Dom, what is the gospel? It starts with God, that he is the creator and he owns everything in the universe. Psalm 24, one says, the earth is Yahweh's as well as its fullness, the world and all those who dwell in it. If you see something created, God is the one that created it. He is perfectly holy. 1 John 1.5 says, This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And the expectation is since God is holy, you are to be holy. And it's not just to be holy, but God requires perfect obedience to the law. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all, which means that as human beings, we have a problem. And that's where the gospel starts. The gospel starts with the bad news that we have broken God's law. 
Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we will pay the eternal penalty for sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And the Bible says there's nothing that you can do to save yourselves. Titus 3.5, he saved us not by works which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, which means that if you want to be saved, your only hope is Jesus Christ. He came to this earth as a sinless man and obeyed every single one of God's commandments. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And he demonstrated by his life and his death and his resurrection that he can forgive the penalty of sin. And we read that in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And listen, some people stop there, but it's not just that Jesus died, but he rose victoriously from the grave and he ascended to the right hand of God on high. He was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And therefore, Everyone, everywhere is called to repent and believe. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to Yahweh and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And Jesus himself, he says, Look, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. Listen, the gospel saves. Romans says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you're here and you don't have that assurance, and if you are not positive that you are going to heaven, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Acts 17, 30 sees, reads this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now commanding men that everyone everywhere should repent. How foolish for John to say, Yeah, I am the Baptist. I am the man. When he knows he can do absolutely nothing for that person eternally other than point him to the one who has the power to forgive sins. And so he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, once John fulfills his mission and prepares people for the coming of Christ, he's taken off the scene. But people want to know, well, what happens to John? And so Luke briefly tells us the rest of the story, and we don't see this in Luke, but we'll see it in the other Gospels. This leads us to our fifth and final point. When we call others to repent of their sin and turn to Christ, you must expect opposition. In verses 19 and 20, but when Herod the Tetrarch was reproved by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. And you know the rest of the story. Herod had his head chopped off. Just real briefly, Herod Antipas, the king, the tetrarch, who's supposed to be a, a model for the people, he's anything but. He goes and he marries his brother's wife, who actually is also his niece. So he's not only committing adultery, but it's incest. He's betraying people. He's ruining marriages. He's committing adultery. He's obviously transgressing God's command. Leviticus 20, verse 21 says, if there is a man who takes his brother's wife, it is an impure act. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. This was a great offense to God. He can care less. He does what he wants to do. And John calls him out on it. Unafraid. Unafraid to tell the religious leaders of their sin, 
unafraid to tell the military of their sin, unafraid to approach kings and princes and dignitaries to tell them that is sin. And Herod shuts him up and ultimately, because of his lust and enjoying a little dancing scene, chops John the Baptist's head off. But listen, doesn't matter what the consequences are. Doesn't matter what the repercussions are. The gospel is too important. Jesus is too valuable. We must preach the word regardless of how it's received, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether you're talking to a person down the street or it's a person in power. We must be faithful Christians to preach the gospel. Let me close with some investigation I did this week. In 2017, one of the greatest pieces of art was discovered. It was thought to be lost for good. It was an original painting called Savator Mundi. There are several things that made this painting so remarkable. The first was the artist, just a guy by the name of Leonardo da Vinci. And because there were less than 20 paintings attributed to da Vinci, this was historically significant. I mean, what a great day in the art world. What was also fascinating was that the work itself, Salvador Munti, is Latin for Savior of the World. And as I was researching this, I was really intrigued, and so I did a deep dive and discovered that this painting was placed in the most expensive frame. It's a 16th century Italian frame finished in black with a gold stencil design and detail. It's beautiful. The frame alone is worth $50,000. It's more than most great works of art. But the painting itself, 400 and $50.3 million. It is the most expensive painting ever sold at public auction. Let me ask you this. When is the last time you went to a museum to look at the frames? Now granted, there are some frames that are pretty. They're impressive. There are some frames that really make the painting stand out. But ultimately, what are our eyes drawn to? The beauty of the painting, the detail, the color, the intricacies, even the simplicity. You see, when you encounter an invaluable piece of art, the way that you appreciate it is you stand in awe and you marvel at its beauty. John the Baptist, you and me, we're all picture frames. We may not be $50,000 kind of picture frames like John, but we have the same purpose. Our purpose is to put him on display, to point to him as the only hope for salvation. Christian, God has called you today and this week to point everyone's attention, not to you, but to Jesus Christ, the satisfier of souls. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so thankful for your word, thankful for the power, the clarity, the beauty of your word. So I suppose, Lord, that some might even become so enthralled with the actual words on the page that we skip the word made flesh. I suppose, Lord, that some might be so enamored with right theology that we can skip Christ entirely. But I pray, God, that you would prevent us from ever taking our eyes 
off the prize, taking our eyes off the beautiful one, the magnificent one, the glorious one, the all-wise one, the all-powerful one. Oh, Lord, would we fall in line with John the Baptist and confess with him, oh, may he increase and may we decrease because he is so mighty and so worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.